After critical emergency incidents like mass shootings, there's a huge uptick in requests for emergency response training, how one local organization gathers the information they need in order to train others to the best of their abilities. Plus, the Artemis mission is hoping to launch tomorrow after Monday's attempt was scrubbed. And now we're learning more about who will actually be on the mission. The purpose of sending these dummies up to space. You can't send dummies to space, can you? Test. And Test what it. experts are hoping to learn from them. And it's another big night of high school football. We're going to have a preview of the top three games to watch tonight coming up in a few minutes. Live from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Happy Friday. It's, it's Friday. Yes. It's a beautiful Friday. Not a big chance of rain today, but boy, get ready for this weekend. We could have a, a lot of moisture in the air this weekend. So that's something to look forward to. How many people are going to have to mow their yards over the weekend? Uh, probably some when it's not raining. Yeah, you got to dodge that. That's true. Right now we're just dealing with a little bit of humidity. 78 degrees for now, but I guess things will warm up to the 90. They will, yeah, we're, we're thinking 90s this afternoon. So yesterday we got up to 93, probably a little bit warmer today. Not a lot of rain, as you guys pointed out, but things do change over the weekend. So let's look at the weather headlines here. And as we look at the time lapse, you can see the clouds had rolled in a little bit earlier this morning. And uh, yeah, just isolated stuff this afternoon. When do we start to see the heavier rain? Well, that's probably Saturday afternoon. And how much can you expect? Some places could see one to two inches. Now that's not going to be everybody, but uh, there could even be more in spots. This is going to be kind of spotty in nature. Some places may get a lot, others may not get so much, but we think that the coverage will be pretty good during the day on Saturday, maybe even into Sunday as well. It, again, all weekend, yeah, there's good rain chances on Sunday too, but I'll tell you, it's not going to be raining all weekend long. It's just that uh, we'll see uh, periods where we'll see some pockets of heavy rain and rainfall here around South Texas. 79 right now, mostly cloudy. Dew point is at 74. South southeasterly winds at around three miles per hour. Feels like 82 at this hour. And a quick check of the radar. Not much there. We've got some showers out west. Otherwise, everyone else is looking at quiet conditions. Pauling County is just in. Molds are dropping. They're at 8, 10, and moderate. Fall Elm is low. And your case at 12 hour forecast today. We should be up into the 90s by 2 o'clock. 94, your high temperature, 20% chance of rain, which means Friday night football should be able to uh, be played without a problem. We'll have to watch for a couple lightning strikes here and there. Otherwise, turning mostly cloudy tonight. And yes, again, rain chances this weekend. We'll talk much more about that weekend and Liberty forecast coming up in just a couple minutes, guys. Steven. Hey, thanks, Justin. I appreciate that. Let's go ahead and get a look there at the roadways because we are seeing some light traffic, completely different situation than what we saw a little bit earlier, where there were a few crashes that were plaguing the roadways, and we saw a lot of buildup that was taking place there off 90 West at Zazamora. You can see now traffic is moving there without any trouble. Loop 410 at 13. You can't really see a lot out there, but traffic seems to be moving just fine. Taking you right to the map, though, we do have a few crashes still to talk about. First one that we're going to bring you to is over here on the northwest side there at loop 1604 where it's always pretty much a trouble spot for drivers but this crash in the eastbound lanes isn't really helping anything you can see at Babcock is where that buildup is starting to uh, really take place so just watch out for that and of course we'll watch it closely and look for any solutions that you may perhaps need but taking you down over here we did have that crash as I mentioned that cleared off of US 90 at eastbound right there at Zazamora so not causing trouble for drivers anymore but of course we're going to continue to watch the roads closely throughout the morning especially with folks traveling this Labor Day weekend. Just be extra cautious out there and make sure to plan your commute ahead of time. All right. Thank you, Stephen. We look forward to talking to you later in the newscast about the solutionary story. In the meantime, here is today's nine at nine. Former constable Michelle Barrientes Vela was found guilty on both counts of tampering with government records. The jury deliberated for less than four hours. Barrientes Vela is scheduled to be back in court later this month to begin the sentencing phase of her trial. However, prosecutors say it is likely Barrientes Vela will be given probation. As the November midterm elections approach, President Biden calling for unity. At the same time, ramping up his criticism of his predecessor and so-called MAGA Republicans. During his primetime address to the nation last night, President Biden cautioned the country that equality and democracy are under assault. The results of the midterm election will decide the balance of power in Washington. Former President Trump and the Justice Department are waiting to hear from a federal judge on whether to appoint a special master to review documents the FBI retrieved from Mar-a-Lago. 
If the judge rules in favor of Trump, lawyers for both sides will offer suggestions for who will review the materials, but the decision will ultimately be made by the judge. Pfizer says the first doses of its COVID-19 booster have already been shipped to 62 locations across the U.S. The new booster vaccine targets both Omicron subvariants BA4 and BA5. Pfizer-BioNTech's updated booster vaccine has been authorized for people 12 and older. Moderna's new booster shot has been authorized for people 18 and older. After getting approval this week, both boosters can now start being administered. Millions are set to travel this holiday weekend. The travel app Hopper estimates that over 12 and a half million passengers are scheduled to fly from U.S. airports over the Labor Day weekend. It comes on the heels of a summer of massive flight cancellations, but some industry experts remain cautiously optimistic about air travel this holiday weekend and predict a smoother fall travel season. All eyes on the markets as many U.S. stocks ended slightly higher yesterday after four days of losses. The S&P 500 up 0.3% after dropping 1.3% earlier in the day. The Dow up 0.5%, but tech-heavy Nasdaq. Say this is due in part to comments from Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. Friday, Powell noted the central bank is focused on fighting to reduce inflation and said it will take, quote, forceful and rapid steps against it. Freddie Mac's chief economist says the aggressive has helped drive rates higher and will likely lead to a slowdown in home sales and pressure to drop prices. The jobs report out yesterday shows jobless claims have fallen to the lowest level in two months. According to the Labor Department, in the week ending August 27th, 232,000 Americans have filed for unemployment benefits for the first time. That's a drop of 5,000 from the previous week. Many firms' workforces are near pre-pandemic numbers, but the Wall Street Journal reports a lot of new hires are inexperienced, contributing to slow service and mistakes. Some airlines saying ground operations aren't going as smoothly, causing delays and lost luggage. And nurses starting hospital jobs have never touched a breathing patient. Companies are now investing in training. And that's today's Nine at Nine. In your morning headlines, an update on a little boy who was paralyzed in the Highland Park 4th of July parade shooting and details on who's going to be flying inside the Artemis 1 launch tomorrow. Plus, does blue light cause you to age faster and all eyes on the Williams sisters at the U.S. Open and what was probably their last match together. Erica Nandez joins us live this morning with all of these stories. Good morning. Good morning. Have you guys been watching the U.S. Open? A little bit. A little bit. All eyes on the Williams yeah. sisters. Not was, a good night for them, ooh. though, for the first round. We'll get to ooh. that in just a bit. But first, the family of the eight-year-old boy left paralyzed from the 4th of July mass shooting in Highland Park says he may have some cognitive loss. Cooper Roberts, who is now paralyzed from the waist down after being shot in the back, has been going through rehabilitation. Therapists are now seeing short-term memory loss, word recovery issues, and loss of fine motor skills. The, rehabilit the rehabilitation team is working with the family to assess long-term needs for Cooper after he eventually does return home from the hospital. Seven people were killed and dozens more were injured in the mass shooting during the Independence Day parade. Now we're all getting a little more insight of who or what will be inside the first Artemis mission. It is an unmanned test flight, but some pretty high tech test dummies are taking the first ride on NASA's new space, space launch system rocket. Meet Commander Munikin Campos. He will be wearing a special survival suit that is outfitted with sensors that will measure the type of deep space radiation that exists beyond the moon, whatever that means. Helga and Zohar, who two additional mannequins, will join Commander Campos. The dummies are also made of materials that mimic the human body. Last week's launch of Artemis 1 was scrubbed, but now has been rescheduled for tomorrow. Next up, we might want to listen to this next story. I'm not sure we're all kind of probably guilty of some days enjoying too much screen time. Well, now a new study says it could be causing you to age faster. A new study is taking a closer look at blue light, which emits from televisions and mobile devices as well as other gadgets. Scientists studying fruit flies found that high energy doses of the light appear to damage a wide range of cells from skin and fat cells to sensory neurons. These changes may accelerate the cells aging and lead to them dying prematurely. One scientist suggests avoiding excessive exposure to blue light as a good anti-aging strategy. 
The researchers do note, though, people are generally exposed to less intense light that was used in the study. That means the cellular damage may be less dramatic, so don't panic yet. And now back to that heartbreaking loss in the U.S. Open's double first round for sisters Serena and Venus Williams in what could be the last time they play together in a pro tournament. After about a two-hour match, the Williams sisters fell in straight sets against a team from the Czech Republic. They played a packed house, and despite the crowd going wild, they could not pull ahead. Nobody expected it to end this soon for the sisters, who had a remarkable career as partners, winning 14, that's right, 14 women's doubles grand slams. This was Venus' last match of the U.S. Open after first round singles loss on Tuesday, but Serena continues what is being called her farewell tour. Later today, she will not, let me say that again. Serena, who is still not really mentioning her possible retirement, expressed her love of the game. Wow, yes. that's impressive. Yeah, she is, I, I mean, all eyes, I've watched, I think I saw her first match, amazing. She still looks so strong out there. The definition of greatest of all time. Yeah. Yes, yes, sure. exactly. I'm just glad they're not sending the crash dummies up in the Artemis. They're well, sending like... They're high-tech. High-tech dummies. High-tech dummies, high -tech dummies. Not yeah. With, with the special suits. Yeah. 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 Well, you know who the crash test dummies are, right? The ones that crash, that test the cars. Oh, I think like crash around the outside oh, yeah, of the car. Yeah. The crash test oh, dummies. I thought They're... you were talking about the band. <laughs> the crash <laughs> test dummies from the wow. There's a band named Crash <laughs> Test Dummies? Yes, yes, there is, David. Yes. Wow. Well, maybe they'll go up and sing some songs <laughs> as they fly around the space and land on the moon. Who knows? No. I, I, I missed that one somewhere. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Time now, 9, 10, and 78 degrees for now. Are they country? No. Uh, see, there you go. <laughs> and coming up on GMSA at 9. Families are struggling, and the food bank is asking for your help. It doesn't matter what you do, do something. And September is Hunger Action Month, and residents are not the only ones impacted by inflation. So is the San Antonio Food Bank, what you can do to help someone in need. September is Hunger Action Month, and the San Antonio Food Bank has its hands full, trying to get more and more stomachs full. With inflation and rising food and fuel costs, not only are local families hurting more financially, but the food bank's mission has become that much more expensive. Max Massey explains what the food bank is now facing and how you can help. It's just choosing to do something. Hunger Action Month is this 30-day window that just says, hey, doesn't matter what you do, do something. The San Antonio Food Bank has been a staple of our community over the years. And this month, September, in particular, it is crucial for the food bank's mission. With inflation and, and just the economy kind of tightening up a little bit, we're seeing that number now just over 100,000 people a week. And so it's almost back to what it was at the onset of the pandemic, which has us alarmed. We're seeing more people, and to be honest, the supply isn't keeping up. The mission of feeding hope and fighting hunger, it's getting more and more difficult with these rising costs. It's, it's everywhere we turn around, the cost of distributing food and the supply chain logistics are just at an all-time high. Families are struggling and the food bank is asking for your help. It's about people getting the food that they need for themselves and their loved ones. As life becomes more and more expensive for families around our country and here at home, this month is about putting our community on notice. At the San Antonio Food Bank, we're just encouraging people to take action. That hope is an action and there's little things we could all do to help nourish our community. During Hunger Action Month, there are so many ways to help out. You can donate food, you can volunteer, you can help fill the empty shelves, or you can just fill a Ziploc bag and give food to people in need. Let's do something, San Antonio. Let's, let's all make a resolve to, to be kinder, to be nicer, to express love, to give hope, and to use hope as an action as a way. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. So Eric Cooper is asking for your help. And if you are looking to get involved, scan the QR code on your screen. It'll take you to KSET.com. We've got a list of the 12 most wanted food items at the food bank and RBFCU are collecting. That's right. You'll also find details on where you can drop off any donations throughout the month of September. There are more than 25 locations, so you're sure to find a place close to you.
All right, let's check in with Justin Horn. The weather, we've been talking about it uh, all morning, practically all week, that this weekend could, could get a little uh, interesting. Yeah, we'll take it. It's, uh, it's nice because uh, we're sort of entering our second uh, weather season, as we call it, second rainy season. We get the spring, and then as we get into the fall, we start to see more rain. This is kind of right on cue. We've got some good chances of rain this weekend. Of course, it lines up with Labor Day weekend. So if you're doing some traveling, here's what you can expect. A lot of the state's going to see some rain out of this, and now it's going to be more concentrated here around South Texas. As you go north, rain chances do come down. Uh, this is Saturday, by the way, so we're talking tomorrow, but in Dallas, a 30% chance of rain. Houston, a 90% chance of rain. Laredo and Brownsville, pretty good shot at some showers and storms there, too. El Paso, as you head west, things will dry out, so just a 10% chance of rain there. Some of the interstates, highways, they are potentially going to be wet over the weekend, so heads up. Right now, we've got mostly cloudy skies here in San Antonio. 79, dew point is at 74, feels like 82. And as we look at the uh, satellite picture here, some clouds over San Antonio as you go east of town. And it's the way it's been really the last couple of days. You find a lot more sun, you go west of town. More clouds and even a few showers across northern parts of Alverde and Edwards counties. But nothing here in uh, Bear County at this hour. 80 degrees at Simpson, 79 Port SA, 73 Bernie Stage. It is already up to 80, though, in New Braunfels. And uh, looking at the big picture here, We've got showers that line up from Dallas back out towards West Texas, a weak boundary there. That's kind of sinking south. We've got energy moving in from the north and that upper level energy, we'll call it rain making energy. This uh, darker color you see here that represents where there's some good lift. So we have that working in and it will be with us Monday even into Tuesday. You combine that with some good moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. So this uh, this is looking at moisture content in the atmosphere, not just at the surface, but all the way up. And uh, it's already in place, but it gets a little bit deeper as we head into Saturday and Sunday. So you put those two things together and that equals a pretty good chance for rain. So let's walk you through the forecast here. 20% chance this afternoon. This is around five o'clock. Like yesterday, it'll be that hit or miss type stuff isolated. It does show a few storms overnight potentially. And then as we get into Saturday, as that energy begins to move in, we bump up our rain chances, especially by the afternoon. 60% chance here by Saturday, say 5 o'clock. And then we keep that right, going right on into Sunday. Tomorrow, rain chances start off pretty low, but they build. And by the afternoon, that's when we see that 60% chance of rain. And there could be some heavier pockets of rain. And then from there, we do a 60% chance of rain Sunday, 50% chance Monday, 40% chance Tuesday. And it's through this entire period where if we do get some of that heavy rain, it could add up to some pretty good totals. These are numbers we have not seen in a long, long time. And look, these are just estimates. Not everyone is going to get this much rain. Some may get more, some may get less. This is broad brush, but maybe one to two inches here, San Antonio on the I-10 corridor. And then as you go south, you'll get some potentially bigger numbers uh, with some really healthy rainfall. It's going to help with our drought situation. Forecast for today is just 20% chance of rain. Temperatures make it up to 94 for a high. In the extended forecast, we're going to go 86 tomorrow, 60% chance of rain, 60% as we said Sunday. And that does bring the temperatures down into the 80s for highs. That'll be the case on Labor Day too. 88 Tuesday, 40% chance of rain. And as I've been saying all morning, this is not one of those situations where it's going to be raining the entire weekend long, you'll still have some opportunities to fit some outdoor activities perhaps in there, but you'll want to keep that case at weather app handy. Watch for those storms as they develop and know you may be dodging some weather this weekend, guys. We'll be watching closely. Yep. Thank you, Justin. It is now 920 and 79 degrees. And coming up next, how a local organization is training others to respond to incidents like a school shooting and why they say constant training is important. With the uptick of school shootings, school safety is a major concern plaguing parents, students, and communities everywhere. Those concerns dramatically increased in our area after the deadly school shooting in Uvalde. And as that community continues to heal, students are preparing to return to class just about three months after that horrific day. School safety is the topic of our latest Solutionaries piece, and as Stephen Cavazos took part in it by showing us how one organization is preparing law enforcement officers to be ready to respond to incidents like in Uvalde. See those little faces on those crosses? It's, it's not right. This should not have been something that happened. I've never been scared like this before. If we don't change nothing, it's gonna be the same and it's gonna happen again and again. It's unbelievable 
and your mind instantly goes back to the kids that you know in your life, the ones that are supposed to be enjoying those last days of school, hanging out with their friends and laughing. And to know that they spent those last few moments of their life in terror, it's emotionally scarring. So many parents are, are just trying to come to terms with the news that they're hearing today. People really all over the country who have come here to pay their respects to the 21 victims of the Robb Elementary shooting. These are not just headlines. These are people's lives. These are lives that were lost that day. Whenever you have a situation like that that unfolds and when you see that delayed response, it's it turns to anger and frustration. What you see is the typical re police response time is about three minutes. So that's lightning fast. You're not going to get any faster than that unless you're lucky and there just happens to be a police officer standing right there when it starts. Of course, the event doesn't end just because that first officer arrives on scene. And so that's the number we're talking about from 911 call to first officer on scene is about three minutes. Obviously, then the officer has to figure out where the attacker is, go find the attacker and stop the killing. So that can take longer than that. I'm Pete Blair. I'm the executive director of the Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training Center at Texas State University. We're currently out at our range facility uh, in Maxwell, Texas. We actually have a staff of researchers who are involved in looking at not only the events to find out what the patterns and trends are in the events, but also at specific techniques and tactics and how those work and comparing which ones work better than the others. And then we publish that in peer-reviewed journals. They heavily rely on that research to guide them in understanding these situations that happen and how to better prepare for that. Anytime we have a major attack, there's always an uptick in the number of requests, but our requests have gone up about tenfold uh, in the month following Uvalde and have continued on from there. Each kit is designed to allow the location that receives the kit to teach the entire course. So it's got all the equipment you need to teach our particular courses. We can either send our instructors out to the location and they teach the course themselves, or we also have a train the trainer program that's designed to have that agency develop their own trainers that can then provide that training. Each situation is not the same. They can only take what they learn from one situation and apply it to the next. You have to train them constantly. You have to equip them with the equipment that they need if they're going to perform on the day when the attack happens. It's not like just being a police officer gets you experience and all of a sudden you're this tactical genius who can handle these complex situations. So because you're not developing that practice and that skill on the job every day, you have to train to develop that skill so on those rare days that you do need it, you have that skill set in place. And like we mentioned, this is just one story, part of our larger Solutionaries piece about school safety. The whole episode includes stories from our other sister stations in Houston, Detroit, Orlando, Jacksonville, and Roanoke. You can watch the entire piece right now on KSAT.com, on the KSAT Plus app, or on the Solutionaries YouTube channel. And after the break, Stephen is going to join us again to talk more about this story that he did. He's going to share his biggest takeaway from visiting the Alert Center and explain a little more about Solutionaries. It is now 928, up to 80 degrees. We'll be right back. Well, before the break, we showed you how the Alert Center, which is just outside of San Marcos, is preparing law enforcement officers to be ready to respond to critical incidents like school shootings. And our Stephen Cavazos did the story and joins us now live to tell us a little more about it. Hey, good morning, Stephen. Hey, good morning, guys. A uh, tough subject, but, you know, first of all, what was it like, you know, kind of reliving the day of Uvalde and the days that followed after it? 
You know, and you and I had these conversations even leading up to the story that uh, was just told. It's it's a daunting task, and it really is because you're going back and you're reliving the emotions of that day. And I always say first and foremost, you know, I was one of the ones that looked at it through the lens of our reporters, our anchors, our producers, uh, people behind the scenes that were out there talking to the community and, their, and hearing their grief. So we saw it through that lens. And then you obviously think about instantly the kids in your life. And that was one of the things that was really important to touch on. Uh, you saw me talking to my laptop that was actually, uh, I was being interviewed by Jeremy Allen, who's a special contents producer with Graham uh, Media, our parent company. And we really wanted it to be an approach that was an honest conversation. And we talked about the emotions and you have to lead with emotions in stories like this. This is not a typical story where it's just always about the facts. Sometimes it's about the emotions behind it. So. Going back and I set with through uh, the video, watching the video with our photographer, Eddie Latico, who also took part in this story. And we went through files and files and files of B-roll and video that we had. So it takes you back to those emotions that day. And it's just utterly heartbreaking when you really just know what the outcome is. Also in that story, we saw you visit the alert center where they teach responders how to respond to these these type of incidents. So as you were going through there, what kind of stood out in your in your mind as, as these guys go through these training? Yeah, David, you know, alert. Uh, we've actually done a few stories with them in the past. And so alert, as you saw in the story, uh, they talk about an array of different things. And what really stood out to me is just how specific their research is. And, you know, when the story you saw that the FBI recognizes them as the national standard, and that is because everything that they do goes based off of data or data that they review and from real life situations. And so they'll go back and they'll look at what particular incident happened. Let's say it was at Columbine and what took place there, because really that's how this was birthed between the Hayes County Sheriff's Office and of course uh, the San Marcos PD, as you saw in the story. But really they'll look at these situations that were tragic and then they'll go back and see what, how they can implement that into their training. What are better tactics to use as opposed to maybe something we saw take place at a different situation. So they're very specific. And speaking of that, you know, explain a little bit about solutionaries. We know they're not the typical stories that we mm -hmm. see as we saw, like, you know, just before the break when yeah. you came on here. I think when I was approached about solutionaries, I say it's like purposeful journalism. And it really is because as journalists all the time, you know, we look at the stories. What are situations that are really uh, plaguing our communities? You know, it could be something. One of the topics was uh, back in June, July was safer streets. And we know that that's a big talking point right there. So we obviously go back and we'll look at those uh, situations, but not just the situation. We try to bridge to the solution. And at times you have to also be transparent. The solution may not be the end solution to it, but this is just one approach that let's say one organization is taking to try to solve a, a problem in their community. So this is a very long episode. There's a yes. lot of details in this episode. So yeah. what are some of the other stories that are about school safety in this particular one? Yeah, you mentioned it as we went to commercial break. We, this is a partnership that we have with our sister stations across the country. And, you know, some of the topics that are mentioned are not just the alert center here uh, just outside of San Marcos. We are talking to a sheriff in Central Florida who is talking to students about ways that they can uh, really prevent bullying and when to identify those those methods or when that to identify those uh, types of situations, I should say. Then we have another uh, story out from Sandy Hook where friends are trying to get together to create a campaign of safety awareness. So there's really, this is just one facet to a bigger story, piece of storytelling there. And, and I really think that this is really gonna be a different and interesting approach to looking at journalism in the future as well as not just of looking at issues and tragedies, but trying to find out what comes next and what those answers look like. Well, I like that purposeful, purposeful journalism. journalism. And I think that's a really important to use regardless if it's a solutionaries piece or not. But it's also giving information to parents and even some of the responders on yeah. on the situations and, and yeah. teaching them how to react to these it, situations. Exactly. So that's and it, important. I think that and just to end it on that, I mean, I think that that was definitely one of the important takeaways as well is just knowing how these law enforcement agencies are going to respond and, and how this training could really make a difference in a matter of minutes. Minutes uh, are very vital, as we, we know, following Uvalde. Yes, definitely. Well, yeah. Stephen, thank you so much for breaking this down for yeah. us. We appreciate Thanks, guys. it. Great information. There are multiple ways to watch our solutionary stories. All you can do is head over to kset.com for more information. That's right. A lot of this talk about school safety has been brought up again after the deadly shooting in Uvalde, and today we will be there for the big community 
The Coyotes will take the field for their first home game of the season. And our Jonathan Goto tells us what we can expect and how you can watch the game if you're not able to go. Good morning, David and Stephanie. A big day for sure. As we know, nothing brings a community together like football season. And tonight, Friday Night Lights will definitely be shining bright in Uvalde. We are live streaming Uvalde High School's first home game this season following the tragedy at Robb Elementary School. They will be taking on Wynn High School out of Eagle Pass. This is our way of showing support for the community as they focus on healing and their future. The Coyotes won their first road game against Carrizo Spring last week. The final score, 21 to 13. The community will also be celebrating the 50th anniversary of their state championship team. KSAT 12 Sports' Greg Simmons and Larry Ramirez will call the game live in Uvalde along with a large KSAT 12 production crew. Our hope is that we can shine a light on the students and show the resiliency of the Uvalde community. You can catch all the action on our digital and streaming platforms. Our live stream starts at 6.30 and make sure not to miss kickoff at 7. Reporting Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Of course, that's all happening tonight. Well, the Houston Texans were able to shine a light on the community, on the Uvalde football team. The Coyotes got a visit from the Texans. They actually showed up for their pregame meal, which happened last night. And then this morning, you can see all the football players up there in the stands and the coach there talking to the Texans. That is Camus, Gregor Hill, and Christian Kirksey from the Texans. Here they are going to their meal last night along with head coach Levy Smith. And today they presented all the players with brand new uniforms. We're talking helmets and jerseys and pants, even mouth guards. Yeah, you said mouth guards They, as well. they even yeah. got some new mouth guards. So, so that was great. And the Texans also announced that on their home opener, I think we might get that, get that again, they are going to be wearing a sticker on the back of their helmets inside NRG Stadium when they took on the Indianapolis Colts, the Indianapolis Colts, and that sticker will say Uvalde Strong. And I think so. in that video they were showing them that sticker or where yeah. it will be placed for that game. So, so that, is, that is awesome that they're getting that support from the, from the Houston Texans. And also, they're actually going to do a little clinic later on today. They got the pep rally at 2 o'clock with the Texans, and the cheerleaders are coming in, and the owner of the Texans is coming in. And so they're going to do a, a, a clinic for a, a lot of the kids there in that community. So Uvalde kids will get some get some coaching from yeah. some of those players so that'd get be fine. some get some good support yeah. well, it's good to see let's look outside with live cam it is 939 and we are creeping up to 80 degrees although still some clouds out there still some clouds so we're starting to see clouds actually increase a little bit just here within the last 20 minutes or so so mostly cloudy skies here at the airport let's look at the big picture across texas we've still got some rain across north texas dallas fort worth stretching over to west texas that energy is going to be sinking south as we head into tomorrow, and that's what's going to give us our better chances of rain here locally. Our case had 12 hour forecast today, 10% chance of rain through noontime, mostly cloudy skies and then partly cloudy this afternoon, 94. We'll bring rain chances up just slightly to 20% this evening, isolated stuff today. But uh, as I mentioned, tomorrow those rain chances go up fairly, uh, fairly significantly. Uh, football forecast tonight, if you're heading out to any of the games, kickoff, It'll be around 90. It's still going to be pretty toasty and humid by halftime. 84 sunset is around 755. Guys. Thank you, Justin. Time now, 940 and 80 degrees for now. You are watching GMSA at 9. And tonight is the second big Friday night of high school football. When we come back, we're going to tell you the top three matchups to watch tonight. Week one of high school football brought some pretty unforgettable matchups and week two continues tonight with several great matchups as well. Andrew Seely breaks down the best games to stream on the big game coverage app tonight. This Friday night, the big game in our big game coverage is also the best game on the streaming schedule. Steele versus Lake Travis. Scrambling. Still scrambling. Throws. The Knights rallied late to top Brandon 35-34 in the final game of the KSAT Pigskin Classic this past Saturday, while the Cavaliers lost their season opener on the road against Arlington Martin 39-31. Lake Travis quarterback Bo Edmondson did not play in that game. The Michigan State commit has been dealing with lower back tightness, but the Knights expect a real battle all the same. We know that we have a very tough opponent, but we're going to treat it uh, as if it's anybody else. And with their instructions from the coaches, I have nothing but confidence in our team. They're extremely well coached. They're, they're, they're a really good football team in all three phases. Uh, you know, we've played them in the past, and, and it's, it always seems to come down to a 48-minute you know, game, and uh, I wouldn't expect anything different this year.
Meanwhile, Judson is right back on the practice field after an emotional victory over Johnson. The Rockets play host to Austin Westlake, the three-time defending state champions. We know they're a great team. They, Everybody knows who they are. We're the underdogs, most definitely, but like Coach told us today, we worry about ourselves and we'll get the job done. Yeah! And on the other side of town, Somerset and Southside will renew the battle of 1604. Both teams come into this matchup undefeated at 1 0. Somerset won the most recent meeting last year thanks to a defensive gem 10 6. I'm Andrew Seeley. And we've had chances of rain yep. and not triple digits the last couple of weeks. Ooh. But overall, it was a hot summer, though, Justin. Brutal summer. Mm -hmm. In fact, record setting. We knew that May was hot. Well, May is not included in this, but we know June and July were, were incredibly hot. August started off that way, but we ended on a pretty nice note. Still, even with the cooler temperatures towards the end of August, we uh, officially set the hottest summer on record, 88.1. So that includes June, July, and August. The second hottest was 2011. We all remember that summer. So uh, yeah, we're through it now. Things are looking better and better and we have the rain chances in the forecast. Now we need a lot of rain to dig out of our deficit since, well, sub since September 1st. We've only been in the month two days, so we haven't collected any rain yet, but I do think we will. And since January 1st, we're at 7.22. That is still 13 and a half inches below average. So that's that big deficit we got to get out of here and uh, we'll get some chances. Now, a lot of times we look to the tropics to help us out. And not really the case this year. We are watching a few uh, a few areas out in the Atlantic that uh, are potentially developing here. Now we have a uh, tropical storm Danielle that's moving away in the cooler waters. This system likely does get a name, but it pulls off to the north, and this uh, is not going to affect the land. At least that uh, doesn't look like it will. And then the one behind that, the chances for that developing are lower and lower. So it's active, yes, but nothing that is going to affect land at this point. As we go outside for you, 79 at the airport. We're up to 83 Stinson, 79 Kelly, 79 Randolph. We've got a southeasterly wind anywhere from 5 to 10 miles per hour. Temperatures have made it into the 80s in places like New Braunfels and Pleasanton, 81 in Catula, 76 Kerrville, 78 right now in Uvalde. And uh, around Bear County, mostly upper 70s, although again, Stinson is in the low 80s at this point. And the radar and satellites show that we've got good rain across uh, DFW right now and then some showers still out across West Texas and some of that energy that sits off to our north and will be sinking south, giving us our better chances of rain coming up tomorrow. So this is just one of our computer models, but I think it tells the story pretty well. By 5 p.m. today, just a 20% chance of rain. Isolated stuff here or there. Now as we get into tonight, it does show a little bit more rain developing, possible, but we're going to keep it at 20%. As we get into tomorrow, this is when things really start to ramp up. 40% chance by noontime tomorrow, and then by 5 p.m., 60% chance of rain. Scattered downpours. Some of these could be heavy at times. And it's not going to be uh, consistently raining all day long, but uh, with this uh, kind of coverage, you can expect that uh, you'll, you'll see some rain here and there, and some of it, again, could be heavy. Rain chances tomorrow really do pick up by the afternoon, 3 to 7 o'clock, a window in which we could see some of those better rain chances. And then as we look ahead, Sunday has a 60% chance of rain too. So too does Labor Day. So if you have outdoor plans, know that uh, yeah, the radar could be fairly active. And then rain chances begin to fall off as we head later into next week. Our forecast today just calls for a 20% chance of rain, partly cloudy skies, uh, southeast Julia winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. And so everything should be fairly quiet this evening if you have uh, plans to be out and about. Tomorrow, though, with the added cloud cover and that a good chance for rain, 86 is the forecast high. And then Sunday, even cooler, 83. I think some of the heavier rain will shift south on Sunday, so we could be left with just some showers perhaps around here. But then more energy moves in Monday and Tuesday, bringing more showers and storms. And this could all add up to some pretty decent rainfall, I think, uh, in spots. We're talking one to two inches, maybe some higher totals in places which could cause some minor flooding. Something we'll be looking out for over the weekend. And you said we need the rain, though. In the worst way. We just have to balance that with we don't want flash flooding, right? No. So if we can get some good steady rain in spots and not get the flash flooding, that's ideal. Ideal. You're a cold natured guy. It's going to be done to 83. You got your coat ready to go because you're always <laughs> complaining about how. A little windbreaker. <laughs> hey, well, we keep this studio so cold, man. Man, it's perfect. I, I, I'm on your side, Justin, on that one. <laughs> like, man. I'll be all right. 83, you're going to need like your winter park up. <laughs> Time now is 9.50 and it's 80 degrees. We'll be right back. 
And Tuesday marks the first day of school for Uvalde. We want to hear your messages of hope for the community. Right now on KZ.com, you can share your thoughts for them for the new school year. Just look for this story on our homepage. And be sure to tune in on Tuesday morning. We're going to have team coverage. Mark Austin and Sarah Costa will be live from Uvalde all morning on GMSA. Okay, we're in the low 80s now, up around 94 this afternoon. We'll call for partly to mostly cloudy skies, just a 20% chance of rain today. But as we've been talking about all morning long, better chances of rain this weekend. Some pockets of heavy rain mixed in there. And those good rain chances actually continue right on into Monday and even Tuesday with some scattered downpours. All right, we are going to leave you with a laugh this morning. Have you ever heard of the Texas Bushman? He is a prankster who has gone viral for his river walk scares. All okay, right, well, some of our team got to meet the man behind the bush, and he stopped by the station to do his thing, and the reactions were hilarious. Here they are. That was just right here yeah. in front of, like, right it. outside the break room. That's where that happened. That's That never gets old. That will no. make me laugh every time. That is so funny. The guy brought out a lot of foul language in people, though. That's for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. We did that some editing like, ma magic yeah. out there. Uh, the one that gets me, though, is our photographer, Adam Higgins. He's yeah. just like, oh, yeah, just some guy <laughs> dressed up as a bush. That's so Adam. <laughs> By the way, there there is a backstory. Yes. This young man uh, loves San Antonio. He thinks we've got more energy than a lot of other cities. And so we actually did an interview with him and you will be able to see that interview tomorrow morning on GMSA. Yeah, tune in and you guys have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe this holiday season.